Stage nine, folks. I told you yesterday that this stage might be a big one. Uh, it delivered beyond my wildest dreams. Now, you remember I said that the zero to 10 scale was zero, don't watch it. 10 is force my wife to watch it. And the 10 might be a theoretical thing because there's nothing I can do to make my wife watch it. Well, that happened today. Now, somewhat for personal reasons, I'll explain. Uh, but you'll enjoy it too, I promise. I would start today's stage at like 55K to go. That's when it really turns into a weird, interesting nail biter. I'm gonna make the sponsor thing real quick because I can't wait to get into this stage. Uh, Decathlon, they're my, my clothing sponsors. You can see all kinds of cool outdoor stuff, camping stuff. If you're if you're European, you know they're huge in Europe. They're, they're everywhere. Uh, but it's like awesome discount, all the sports. They got cycling stuff, they got camping stuff. Just some of the doing a big push on uh, on backpacks. They just sent me this new backpack. Nice big laptop compartment here. This will be for my Kindle. The ingenious thing here is they've got this strap on the back so you can attach it to your uh, your rolling bag. But the real thing that sets Decathlon apart is that their prices are made for sort of entry level people to try out the new sports, but it's really nice stuff. So this sort of daily backpack is 60 bucks. But like your big fancy camping backpacks, you can get one of those for like 90. I remember a few years ago, I like wanted to go camping and I was looking at, okay, by the time I buy the tent, buy a sleeping bag, buy the sleeping pads and all the things, I might as well stay at the Four Seasons. Like realistically, I'm gonna go camping you know, once or twice a year. I'm gonna be in the snow once or twice a year. I don't need to spend $500 on like a super fancy jacket. My stuff, it gets it done, uh, check them out. And they're a French company, so I had to give them some love during the Tour de France, of course. Okay, moving on, I've gotta do a very quick note on yesterday uh, because we can't just let this stuff pass on and forget uh, Cavendish. Gotta think how much work, how much time Cavendish put into this one more year uh, to try and get one more stage win. How much he was looking forward to just retiring eating cake, hanging out with his family. Now it's like, do you put that cake away for another year or get a new cake, it'll go stale. Does he want to do the weeks away from the family and deal with the whole tough life and the hard training and the altitude camps and the racing? Or maybe he's having fun, maybe he's having a blast. Maybe there's a version where you can do like an abridged race program where here's your, here's your team, uh, here's your, he'll probably get a million dollars anyway, no matter what he does if he decides to race. Do a couple training camps, do two races to prepare, show up at the tour fresh in 2024, and of course another year older. Uh, it's a slippery beast, the whole thing. So whatever makes him happy, I'm down for it, uh, and I hope you are too. Okay, on to today's stage. So I kinda said this would happen yesterday. Uh, the GC leaders are gonna look at each other, they're gonna keep their teams together, and then there's gonna be a ton of guys who are way down on the GC, who they can just let go. Yumbo Visma, UAE, don't really care about the stage win today. They just want to look at each other. The early break, it was huge. They let everybody up there. If you're if you're 40 minutes down, goodbye. They don't care. And real quick, they got them to, and real quick, they let them have 11 minutes. It was clear that they were going to stay away. There were some good names in there. Uh, Palace got in there to get some more points. Mohoric, a big race winner. I would say the favorites were probably Jorgensen, uh, De La Cruz, and Mike Woods. Jorgensen, an American, rides for Movistar. Uh, he trained in Malibu for a while when he was younger. Uh, this is a guy, he was on Jelly Belly for I forget why he wasn't on the action team. I'm sure there was some silly reason they didn't pick him up, uh, but he still went world tour. But anybody who does a year or two on, we call it the belly, jelly belly, that was sort of like a holding pattern. Uh, that means you've sort of earned your stripes. So always respect to Mateo. He must have been 19 then. Uh, he's been world tour for a while now. Just slow, good progress, uh, knocking on the door of some big results, getting some big results, but knocking on the door of some huge results, including today. But on paper, they were talking about Mike Woods all day. Uh, he was definitely the favorite with the super steep finale, which didn't really do him any favors in the lead up. See, if you're one of those 13 other guys in the break, uh, you don't want to just pull around and get dropped by Mike Woods at the end. So what would happen is guys would be sitting on, uh, I'm gonna stay fresh, they're trying to make Mike Woods pull. Woodsy had one teammate in there most of the day, Guillaume Boyven, also Canadian, they're super good friends. So Guillaume would be trying to keep the peace by taking basically just longer pulls uh, and allowing Mike to stay fresh. De La Cruz, I didn't see him pulling at all. Uh, all I saw him doing was just sitting in the back of the group, drinking water, keeping cool with his little ice socks. What they do is they'll take a, they'll take a stocking, like a lady's stocking, they'll pour ice in it, and then they'll cut it, tie a knot, and keep doing that. And then just, so there's sort of tiny little thing, it's disposable, they'll throw it out. They just stick that right in the back of your neck, uh, and it does kind of keep you cool all day. But the breakaway got ugly, I would say super early. It was 55K to go, they started attacking each other and sitting on each other, and it just got, it, it just got ugly. One was like, it was frustrating to watch, and definitely Mike Woods was the guy who was marked out. And at a point, Guillaume sort of came off, he did his job, and Woodsy was alone to deal with uh, whoever decided to attack him and decide what does he follow, what does he let go. And as we'll eventually see, the bike racing math is pretty interesting on a 13K steep climb. Look at the final results from any mountaintop finish. Look at the size of the time gaps 
sides. These guys all kind of have an idea where they stand and how much they can lose to each other. So if I'm Mike Woods in the break, I'm looking at some guys thinking like, I'll give you five minutes at the base and not worry about it. I'm going to get that back. Other guys, you know, one minute seems like a lot. And then 10, 15 seconds, that's nothing. The race announcer was sort of talking like, it was a point where Mateo had 20 to 30 seconds uh, on a break of four, and they were still 10K from the base. Really at that point, they're acting like this is a dangerous move, and it turned into a dangerous move. But at that point, 20 seconds in a 30 minute climb, uh, that's nothing, especially if a guy has been in the wind. Uh, it all depends on how fresh you are. That's the math that these guys are trying to do or guess uh, on the road. But keep in mind, if you sat on Jasper Philipson and he's drilling himself for four hours on a flat road, you could beat him in the sprint. And the same thing, if you just sit in Mike Wood's draft while he's just burying himself in the heat all day, and then you get to a climb, you could probably put two minutes on him on a mountaintop finish. Okay, you couldn't, and I probably couldn't either, but anybody in the pack could. You see my point. Well, I thought Mateo went too early, but it turned out he was doing uh, what I would say was a smart move for himself. He probably gave himself the best chance to win the stage. Palas also played it smart. De La Cruz played it smart. Uh, all of them kind of kept themselves a good amount of fresh, so that the time gaps on the climb didn't really explode. But of course, who played it the smartest was one Michael Woods. If you read Draft Animals, you know he's a good friend of mine. Uh, I love Mike Woods. One of those guys, I get a lot of comments and people ask the question, all the time like hey is the peloton still clean is it still doping and this is a this is a tough one for for me to answer because obviously uh, nobody knows but kind of like my barometer i've known mike woods forever we were teammates before he was world tour he had no idea how good he was he was a runner there was a point where nbc found uh like a photo of him winning the junior world uh i don't know it was junior pan am championships and he's just got this super cocky grin on. And he switched to bike racing late. Uh, so we were teammates in 2015 and 2016. And the end of 2016, when I'm riding draft animals and I realize my career is done, I'm really striving for like a non-bummer of an ending. And I kind of had to focus on Woods to <laughs> have a vicarious happy ending. People are always asking in the comments, uh, is the Peloton still dirty? Is it possible to race clean? And I, you know, there's, for sure there's somebody doing something in there. It's impossible not to, that's the nature of humanity. But I always tell them like, as long as Michael Woods is at the front, that's a guy who I know to be clean. When he's in the mix, that's really an indicator that if someone is dirty, they're not, they're not that dirty. So today, Woodsy timed it to perfection. I really thought Mateo had it with a couple K to go, but 12%, a lot can happen. And Mike Woods knows like that's when he's best is when it's super steep. I would still say maybe he waited a little bit too long. Maybe the gap to Mateo was a little bit too big, probably too close for Mike's comfort, uh, but he definitely pulled it off. There was nobody else in the photo. And it's a great day for cycling. It's a great day for me. It's a great day for everybody. And this this is the 10. I forced Emily to watch it. When when a good friend of mine wins, uh, I do make my wife watch the bike race. I was DMing Woodsy's wife during the thing. She's over in Andorra with their kids. In my book, I talked about he's got this crazy alien vein in his right calf. Uh, you could definitely see that churning in the in the NBC feed. That made me happy. Bike racing is doing well uh, if he's on top. Armchair team director, uh, I thought that Israel was a little bit too aggressive. I thought Guillaume could have just stayed in the breakaway and pulled it longer rather than attacking and sort of hoping the washing machine played out to Woodsy. Like, Woodsy had to follow a couple attacks, and I would have just absorbed that and let guys go and ride tempo. Those two stay together. The longer they stay together, I thought the better they could do. But whatever, it worked out. I'm not mad. And the timing of it was kind of torture because Woodsy was winning the stage as fireworks were going on uh, 12 minutes behind. So the race was sort of going back and forth for a good hour. They didn't show the peloton at all because the race was so exciting at the front. And then now everything was happening at the same time. But it looked like Yumbo played it conservatively, played it well, uh, kept all their guys together did the turn and burn road tempo, and ultimately put Pogachar uh, on the, he had to be offensive. Uh, he was offensive, but they saved Sep to last. Uh, and Pogachar, I don't know, it takes a big man to admit when he's wrong, that would be me. Pogachar didn't blow the race apart, but definitely put a little bit more time uh, into Jonas's lead. And this is still everybody's bike race. If I'm a gambling man, I still gamble on Jonas and Yumbo, uh, but it is not over. Armchair race organizer, they didn't allow any fans in the last 4K. Uh, that was kind of weird because it was super busy and, and the whole crowds that you're parting, the, that beautiful scenery. Uh, and then you get to 4K to go and it was just like an eerie ghost town. Uh, somehow it didn't take away from the racing. I was okay with it. I see why you'd have to do it on a climb like that. If I was watching in person, where would I want to be? I would find wherever they parked the buses, I would leapfrog the fence and I would bear hug Mike Woods and, and try to just squeeze him to death and like break his ribs uh, with my love. I had a tour of California once. Tom Scringe won a stage and I like jumped the fence and, uh, and attacked him at the press conference. Uh, he, he loved it. It was fine. Unanswerable hypotheticals. Uh, it did sort of turn into a heartbreaker for Mateo, which is a bummer because I like him too. Uh, tough call between those two and really with, with Palace and anyone uh, who I wanted to win this stage. This is Mike Wood's second Grand Tour stage win. He has one stage of the Vuelta. Uh, first Tour de France stage win. Uh, very big deal for him. The other guys, they'll have their time. But what could Matteo have done to potentially win the stage? Um, I do think he went a little bit too early, but had they all gone equal in the last climb, similarly fresh, 
I, I think for sure Mike Woods wins. Mateo maybe pulls off second because, boy, was he strong today. I think he played his cards right, but for sure he's wondering right now, uh, had he not attacked and he kept fresh legs to the finale, uh, how would that have gone differently? Mishap of the day, uh, Mateo Jorgensen's race number. He, he, he seems to have forgotten a pin or the pin popped off. It's still crazy to me. It was crazy to me when I was racing a thousand years ago. It's still crazy to me that the riders pin their own numbers with safety pins on the back of their jersey every morning. You get a fresh number, you get a fresh jersey, and you pin it. It's like kind of a fun ritual in a way. It's a little bit relaxing, but it's also, they can't do better than that. It's completely insane. We also have like transponders. Like no one really should need the race number to figure out uh, who's who. Anyway, but he did a bad job pinning on his number. It was flapping in the wind. That probably cost him three and a half seconds. We're not going to do any hypotheticals on that affecting the stage result. The other mishap, there was a crash in the feed zone. I didn't see how it started, but I, I assume it was something to do with the musette bag. So these are the little cotton bags that you get. Uh, the, the swanier holds them out. The musette will have stuff in, you know, you've got your candy bars, uh, you've got your ice sock, and you, you, you ride by 30 plus miles an hour, you're grabbing this bag. So now you've got a hundred something dudes riding one-handed with something that's 10 pounds on, on the other side they're trying to hold on to and maintain their balance. Uh, and then you, you know, take two hands off the bars to put it over your shoulder, and then you're rooting through it and you're not really paying attention. And at some point when you filled your pockets in and get to discard it, so say it's windy, it gets stuck in somebody's wheel, they're a recipe for disaster for the Musette bags. It's a miracle and a testament to the bike handling skills of these riders that there aren't a thousand pileups in the feed zones from these things, but it's crazy. I don't know what they should do instead other than just more team car action, especially on a hot day like this. You just can't get enough cold water and ice socks on a day like today. But the old Musette crash is just a classic. Also, NBC did a couple slow-mos of Mateo like squirting water on his head. Uh, that was kind of weird and sexy. I liked it. I saw a thing on the Tour de France's Instagram. It was uh, they were asking before the stage. They were asking the riders what town they're in, and and no one knew. Uh, actually, Simon Clark knew, but he admitted he cheated because he looked at a sign. It's one of those I call that uh, stage race zombie. You get into it. You don't. You know. You go where the bus takes you. You find out where the finish is if you happen to see the sign. You're just you're just following the wheels, and then you're following the buses, and you have no idea. They, these guys have no brains anymore. Uh, they're quite focused, and and that's fine. But it is funny to to see it kind of point out and to see the Tour de France admitting it. They'll know when they're in Paris. Last one, a previous winner of the stage. They showed uh, 1988, the Danish Johnny Welts. Uh, Johnny Welts was also mentioned in Draft Animals. Uh, I've mentioned I've had a tough time. I had a tough time when I was on uh, Cannondale, now EF or Garmin Sharp, whatever that team. Uh, um, Johnny Welts was a director that, that, that I liked a lot, that everyone liked. Uh, original Girona guy. He was a guy that, like, help you find your apartment. I said in the book, too, like, if you needed to bury a body in Girona, he'd be the guy to call. But wherever you are, shout out to Johnny Welts right now. And uh, it's cool that in the next guy who wins the stage, also a quality dude. Okay, tomorrow is a rest day. Uh, you will not be hearing from me until the day after. I'll actually be taking my, my backpack to, uh, to Boulder, Colorado for a quick trip. Shout out to Decathlon, awesome partner. Uh, do me a favor, just look at the link in my description, check out their stuff. You will be really stoked at the prices. So again, if you have any soul at all, uh, please watch the stage today. I'll forgive you if you start at 55K to go, you can skip the first half. Then read about Mike Woods and Draft Animals. I'm not trying to sell books here, my royalties are garbage anyway, but it is a good place uh, to, to get to know them a little bit, or just Google them if you don't have time for that. A big love to Mike and Ellie, uh, and thank you all for watching and enjoying, and we'll talk to you in two days.